This episode is made possible by the realistic online game War Thunder. Check out the game through the link in the description below. Go through that link and you'll not only support this show, but you'll also get a free premium tank or aircraft and three days of premium time as a bonus. And let's get into it. Actually, before we get into it, I just want to say that there are French pronunciations in this one. Indeed, the man's name himself, Charles de Gaulle, uh, that's, I believe, how you pronounce it in French. I'm going to go with the accepted English pronunciation of Charles de Gaulle because it's easier for me. I'm less likely to screw it up. There's also other French pronunciations. If you don't like it, deal with it, or just have a go at me in the comments below. I'm not going to read them. <laughs> Charles de Gaulle was the sort of man who turned heads. At six foot five inches in height, he towered over his contemporaries, and with his regal bearing and firm gaze, he exuded an air of forthright self-confidence. Throughout his life, his unswerving love for France, coupled with his determination to right the wrongs of the past, turned him into a hero of the resistance movement and one of the French Republic's truly great statesmen. In today's biographics, we examine the very full life of Charles de Gaulle. Charles André Joseph Marie de Gaulle was born on November the 22nd, 1890. He was the third of five children to Henri and Jean de Gaulle. Henri was a military man who had served in the Franco Prussian War. By the time his second son was born, he was a teacher at a Catholic school in the French industrial region of Lille. Shortly after the birth of Charles, the family moved to Paris, where Henri took up a position as the headmaster of the Jesuit College of the Immaculate Conception. Henri was a lover of history and the glory of France. Nights in the de Gaulle home would often be spent with the children gathered around to listen to their father regale them with stories of the country's history and the part their ancestors had played in it. Charles would later recall the stories his father would tell them about their most famous ancestor, Sewell Johann de Gaulle, a knight who fought against the English at the Battle of Agincourt. The glorious history of his nation that Charles was learning at the feet of his father came with a distrust of the country's natural enemy, the British. Henri would not allow his children to learn the English language. Charles's mother, Jean, loved her country more than her husband. Charles would later say that she had an uncompromising love for her country that was equal to her religious piety. The defeat of France at the Battle of Sedan in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian War was a source of humiliation for all French patriots, including the de Gaulle's. They seethed with the desire to avenge the shame that had fallen upon their once mighty nation. They kept this ambition alive in their children, with Henri regularly taking them to the cemetery at Le Bourget and having them read aloud the inscription to the dead of 1870. The sword of France, broken in their valiant hands, will once more be reformed by their descendants. Even though he wasn't the smartest of the five de Gaulle children, Charles was their natural leader. He had a mischievous dominant attitude and he was always organizing some sort of practical joke on one of his siblings. When he was about six, he invented his own language, which involved speaking French backwards. He forced his brothers and sisters to learn it. They naturally objected, but his insistence paid off and they all became fluent at it. This was an early sign of the determination and persistent force of character that would come to be a trademark of Charles as an adult. Like most French boys, Charles loved to play soldiers. Yet, when he and his brothers lined up their model armies on the bedroom floor, he would exhibit a seriousness and intensity that went way beyond a childhood game. He always insisted on portraying the French army and would become cold and dispassionate during the war games as he put his total energies into defeating the enemy. Charles attended the Jesuit college where his father was the headmaster. He was a keen student who loved to read and developed an early interest in philosophy. By the age of 10, though, he had decided that he was going going to pursue a life in the military. From that point onward, Charles was single-minded in his military focus. At the age of 15, he wrote an essay in which he projected himself forward to the year 1930, where, as General de Gaulle, he led the French army in defeating the Germans, finally inflicting vengeance for the defeat of 1870. Charles was determined to win a place at the military academy at Saint-Cyr. His hard work at school it paid off, and he was accepted into the academy in 1909. However, prospective officers were required to serve a year in the ranks before entering officer training school, and so in October of 1909 he was enlisted into the 33rd Infantry Regiment stationed at Arras. 
Four months later, he won his first promotion to corporal. It was usual for an aspiring officer to reach the rank of sergeant during the first year, but de Gaulle's company commander, Captain Tugoy, refused to bestow this rank upon him. When asked why he had not been promoted, Tugoy commented, Would you have me nominate a sergeant a boy who would only be at his ease as the Grand Constable? In reflecting upon this time with the 33rd Infantry, de Gaulle later made the wry remark that the most valuable lesson he had gotten from his first year in the ranks was that if you did the exact opposite of what you were told to do by the non-commissioned officers, you would get on fairly well. He entered the military academy of Saint-Cyr in autumn of 1910. He quickly earned a reputation as an arrogant dandy with an air of superiority. Two nicknames quickly became attached to him, Le Grand Charles and Le Grand Ospiège. This last title translates as the Great Asparagus and was apparently a reference to his stature. At six foot five inches in height, he towered over virtually everyone that he met. One of his classmates was the future General Betois, commander of French troops in the 1940s Battle of Norway. He remembered de Gaulle as a mediocre student who had few friends. The fact that he graduated 13th out of his class of 211 in 1912 seems to indicate that he was somewhat more than mediocre. It was expected that a young man with the ambition of de Gaulle would be chosen to join a cavalry regiment as that was traditionally the fastest route to promotion through the ranks. However, Charles had already come to the conclusion that the days of the horse soldier they were over. He believed that future wars would be won by the infantry. As a result, he made the decision to return to the 33rd Infantry at Arras. De Gaulle spent the next two years learning the craft of an army officer. It didn't take long for the lanky officer to make an impression in the town of Arras. Heads turned when he passed by, with people being captivated by both his extraordinary height and his regal bearing. Yet his rather caustic, cold nature repelled more than his impressive appearance attracted. Not long after de Gaulle's arrival at Arras, the 33rd received a new commanding officer, Colonel Philippe Petain. Charles develops a great deal of respect for Petain. In his memoirs he wrote, My first colonel, Petain, taught me the art of command. Petain was also impressed with de Gaulle. In October of 1913, he recommended his first promotion to first lieutenant. When war broke out in August of 1914, the 33rd Infantry Regiment, as part of the French 5th Army, was deployed to Dinant in order to halt the German advance throughout that region. De Gaulle was immediately into the action, with his first engagement on August the 15th being the Battle of Dinant. He was wounded in the knee and sent to the hospital to recover. When he returned to the regiment in October, many of his men and fellow officers they were dead. Two months later, he was promoted to Regimental Adjutant. The 33rd Infantry Regiment became famous for their ability to crawl out into no man's land in order to spy on the enemy. The intelligence gathered from this work it won de Gaulle the Croix de Guerre medal. In February 1915, he was promoted to captain. The following month, an inconsequential hand wound would become infected, leaving him out of action for the next four months. During the Battle of Verdun in March of 1916, de Gaulle was wounded in the left thigh by a bayonet and subsequently captured after passing out from the effects of poison gas. De Gaulle spent the remainder of the war in a German prisoner of war camp. He attempted to escape five times. He attempted escape by hiding in a laundry basket, digging a tunnel, digging a hole through a wall, and even posing as a nurse in order to fool the guards. In letters that he wrote to his parents during his captivity, he expressed his great frustration that he was unable to participate in the war effort any longer. He referred to himself as being cuckolded and fell into a state of depression. Following the armistice in 1918, he was released and returned to his parents' home in Dordogne in the south of France. In early 1920, de Gaulle was posted to Poland as part of the French military mission to Poland. There, he served as an instructor to the Polish infantry. He served with distinction, earning the rank of major in the Polish army and being awarded the Distinguished Virtuti Militari, Poland's highest military decoration. He returned to France in 1921 and spent a year as a military history lecturer at the Saint-Cyr Academy. He then spent two years studying at the École Militaire in Paris. He graduated with a grade of assez bien, or good enough, and was then posted to the Rhineland area of Germany, which was under French occupation. During the mid-1920s, de Gaulle worked as a ghostwriter for his old commander at Arras, the now Marshal Petain. In 1926, however, the two had a falling out over a book on the history of the French soldier that de Gaulle had ghostwritten called Le Soldat. 
In October of that year, he returned to the Rhine to commence his military duties there. In 1927, after a dozen years in the army, de Gaulle was promoted to commandant. He was then posted to the occupying forces at Trier in Germany at the head of the 19th Chasseur à Pied, which was a light infantry battalion. De Gaulle was a hard taskmaster on his soldiers, often pushing them beyond what was reasonable. On one occasion, he got into hot water for throwing a soldier into prison for exercising his right to appeal to his member of parliament for a transfer to a less demanding unit. Even though he had had a falling out with Patton, he called on his old commander to help get him out of the mess. With the end of the Allied occupation in the Rhineland in 1929, de Gaulle was posted to Lebanon and Syria. He served with distinction, with his commanding officer providing him with an impressive recommendation when he returned to France in 1931. He then received a posting to the General Secretariat of the Supreme War Council, based in Paris. His job description was as a drafting officer. For the next six years, de Gaulle gained valuable experience in military bureaucracy. Over that time, he worked with government officials in drafting bills related to the military. He worked on a bill for the organization of France during the event of war, but it did not pass the Senate. Throughout this period, de Gaulle was not shy about voicing his opinion on the military preparations that France was making in the event of another European war. He considered the line of fortifications known as the Maginot Line, on which billions of dollars were being spent, to be a wasted effort. Rather than focusing on a defensive footing, he contended that the French needed to be proactive through mechanized warfare that was fast-moving. In 1934, he wrote a book called Toward a Professional Army. In it, he outlined his plans for the future French army, with 100,000 men and 3,000 tanks. In 1937, de Gaulle came a step closer to realizing this ambition when he was given command of the 507th Tank Regiment. With his promotion of the tank as the key to French infantry success, he became a nationally known figure, with people calling him Colonel Motors. Now, just before we get into his later military career, I do want to tell you about today's sponsor, War Thunder. They're fantastic because they sponsor longer videos like this and we can really dive deep into a subject. So, War Thunder is a realistic, free to play combat game. And if you fancy becoming your own, Colonel Motors, then why not give it a try? It always amazes me when I hear that there are millions of players on these online games, but then again, I see why. It's amazing what games are like these days. You can look at it right now. I mean, it looks incredible and it's free, so why not? In this game, there are over 1,200 historically accurate vehicles. There are tanks, aircraft, ships, and just incredible vehicles from the 1930s onwards. Indeed, I'm just about to talk about a French tank, the R35, and that's totally available in War Thunders. So this game is available on PC, PS4, Xbox One, so join us on the battlefield for free using the link below. Doing that supports this show, and it also gets you a free premium tank or aircraft and three days of premium time as a bonus just for registering. And let's get back to it. With the French declaration of war upon Germany in September of 1939, de Gaulle was put in command of the 5th Army's 5 tank battalions, mostly equipped with R-35 light tanks. In early 1940, he lobbied for the position of Secretary General of the War Council, the government's top military advisor, but he was passed over. Towards the end of March 1940, de Gaulle was given command of the newly created 4th Armoured Division. With the German attack on May 10, the 4th Armoured, they went into action. On May 17, they encountered the Germans at Montcornet. It was a disaster for de Gaulle, with 23 of his 90 tanks being destroyed by mines, anti-tank weapons, dive bomber, and ground attack aircraft. Two days later, his reinforced division was decimated for a second time. Despite being ordered to withdraw, he fought on, demanding even more reinforcements. Even though this request was denied, he managed to push the Germans back to Carmont, but this was only a temporary respite. On May 20th, de Gaulle began to retreat in the face of the unstoppable German advance. On May 23rd, he was promoted to Brigadier general. On May the 28th, he led an attack on a German bridgehead at Abbeville, which captured some 400 prisoners. By the beginning of June, de Gaulle had been recalled to Paris, where he was offered, and he accepted the position of Undersecretary of State for National Defense of War. On June the 8th, he met with the Army Commander-in-Chief Wagens, who was about to announce the French surrender. When de Gaulle tried to convince him to fight on, Wagens laughed despairingly. The following day, de Gaulle flew to London, where he met British Prime Minister Winston Churchill for the first time. His attempts to convince Churchill to put more RAF fighters into the battle for France fell on deaf ears. 
Upon his return to Paris, he wanted to defend the city to the last man, but Weygand had other ideas. The government was relocated to Tours, where a series of meetings with British officials were held. During these meetings, de Gaulle's fighting resolve impressed the Brits, standing in stark contrast with other French leaders. On June the 6th, de Gaulle was back in London, discussing the logistics of a troop withdrawal to French North Africa. When he returned to France later that day, he discovered that Prime Minister Renault had resigned to be replaced by Marshal Pétain, who was intent on signing an armistice with the Germans. De Gaulle now fled France for London ahead of the German takeover. On June the 18th, Churchill offered him airtime on BBC Radio to address the French people. In the speech, de Gaulle encouraged his countrymen to be brave during the occupation, resisting it as best they could. The next day, he gave another broadcast. This time, he was more critical of the Bataan government, denouncing it as illegitimate. On June the 22nd, following the signing of the armistice, de Gaulle took to the BBC again. He denounced the surrender and again declared the French government illegitimate. On June the 28th, the British government recognized de Gaulle as the leader of Free France. His government in exile consisted of three colonels, twelve captains, and three battalions of legionnaires. Over the following months, de Gaulle's main weapon was BBC Radio. He would give broadcasts an average of three times per month, denouncing the occupation government based in Vichy and urging Frenchmen to resist the occupation. The Pétain government sentenced de Gaulle to death in absentia. Throughout the war years, de Gaulle was able to slowly build up the Free French Army. On April the 21st, 1943, he boarded a plane en route to Scotland to inspect his navy. The plane almost crashed on takeoff, and it was later found that it had been sabotaged using acid. In May of 1943, de Gaulle moved his headquarters to French Algiers, where he became the head of the French Committee of National Liberation. He became involved in the planning for the D-Day invasion, although the Americans and British became increasingly frustrated with his insistence that he was the rightful leader of France. He returned to Britain on June 4, 1944, whereupon Churchill asked him to address the French people over BBC Radio in anticipation of the Allied invasion. However, the script he was given did not acknowledge him as the legitimate interim ruler of France, and so he refused to deliver it. In the wake of the D-Day invasion of June 6, 1944, the Free French Army, under the leadership of General de Lautre Tassigny, landed in southern France and were instrumental in pushing back the Germans. On June the 14th, de Gaulle returned to France. Traveling through newly liberated Norman towns, he was well received by the townspeople. He established the capital of Free France in Bayeux and then set off to Rome, where he met the newly installed Italian government. From there, he flew to Washington for his first meeting with President Roosevelt. The visit was a strange one, with Roosevelt Roosevelt not providing the usual privileges of a visiting head of state. De Gaulle pushed for the Allies to privatize the liberation of Paris, fearing a communist takeover. But there was no strategic priority for the Allies to focus on Paris. Still, through de Gaulle's insistence, Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower agreed that Paris would be prioritized out of humanitarian and symbolic need. He also permitted the Free French Army to be the first to enter the French capital. On Saturday, August the 26th, de Gaulle entered Paris in a triumphant march down the Champs-Élysées. As the procession made its way towards Notre Dame Cathedral, it came under machine gun fire from Vichy government militia. A BBC reporter who was present noted de Gaulle's demeanor as he confidently strode forward, stating, General de Gaulle walked straight ahead into what appeared to me to be a hail of fire, but he went straight ahead without hesitation. His shoulders flung back and walked right down the center aisle, even while the bullets were pouring about him. It was the most extraordinary example of courage I have ever seen. Upon reaching the Great Hall of the Hotel de Ville, de Gaulle spoke before an ecstatic crowd. His inspiring message included these words. Paris. Paris outraged, Paris broken, Paris martyred, but Paris liberated. Liberated by itself, liberated by its people, with the assistance of the armies of France, with the support and assistance of the whole of France. The enemy is faltering, but he is not yet beaten. He is still on our soil. It will not suffice that we, with the assistance of our dear and admirable allies, will have chased him from our home in order to be satisfied after what has happened. We want to enter his territory, as is fitting, as conquerors. It is for this revenge, this vengeance, and this justice that we will continue to fight until the last day, until the day of total and complete victory. With his bold and triumphant entry into Paris, de Gaulle won the respect of the world. In the days that followed, the Allied leaders made statements recognizing his government as the legitimate ruler of France. The provisional government of the French Republic was established on September 10, 1944. De Gaulle then set out on a tour of the country. In each city, he freely mixed with the crowds, with no regard for his own safety. 
Towards the end of 1944, a legal purge was established to punish traitors during the occupation and remove the last vestiges of the Vichy government. Over the course of the purge, around 2,000 people were sentenced to death. De Gaulle commuted around 1,000 of those sentences. In May 1945, the Germans surrendered, signing an armistice with France in Berlin. However, on the very day that victory in Europe was proclaimed, May 8, riots broke out in French Tunisia. Twelve days later, the French artillery fired on demonstrators in Damascus, leaving hundreds dead. This event caused the ever-testy relationship between de Gaulle and Churchill to reach a low ebb. Churchill commented that de Gaulle was a great danger for peace and to Great Britain. The French Constituent Assembly unanimously elected de Gaulle as head of the French government on November 13, 1945. After two months of struggles with communists within his government, he abruptly resigned and formed the right-wing Rally of the French People. He believed that his popularity as a war hero would propel him back to power, but this gamble it didn't pay off. After three years in the political wilderness, he left the party and politics behind. De Gaulle then retired from public life to write his memoirs. In 1958, a crisis in Algeria brought him back to politics. The Algerian National Liberation Front it was waging a war for independence, and de Gaulle was seen as the kind of strong national leader who could quash it. He returned to the presidency and proceeded to use brutal force to put down the rebels. But these harsh methods they backfired. The Algerian people were driven further towards independence, while around the world there was condemnation against the French government. Under intense pressure from within his own country and abroad, de Gaulle finally granted independence to all 13 French African colonies in 1962. As the Cold War developed, de Gaulle advocated the development of a French nuclear arsenal. The country became the world's fourth nuclear power in February of 1960. Three years later, de Gaulle refused to sign the Partial Test Ban Treaty. In 1965, he was re-elected for a second seven-year term as French president. He ran his government and his country with a heavy-handed dogmatic style that often drew criticism. In early 1969, he called for a nationwide referendum on the reform of the Senate. When his proposal was rejected by the people, he offered his resignation, following through on a televised promise made two days before the referendum. At the age of 78, having lived an extraordinarily full public life, de Gaulle retired to write an updated version of his memoirs. He died suddenly on November 9, 1970, while watching TV. He complained to his wife that he was feeling pain in his neck and then collapsed to the ground. He died within minutes. The autopsy revealed that he had suffered from a ruptured blood vessel. The funeral of Charles de Gaulle on November 12, 1970, it was the largest in French history. Today, he ranks alongside Napoleon as among the greatest of French leaders. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below. Also, don't forget to check out our sponsor for this episode, War Thunder. You'll find them linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.